humbled by uh, not being able to speak once to the London community, but twice. Uh, Detroit's been on a pathway for about the last dozen years to enact urban ag policy. We finally have a very comprehensive ag policy in place as of 2013, 2014, that took three and a half years. Uh, we're now getting ready to implement the other half of the ag policy around animals. Um, and my project is Recovery Park. So a little bit of history of Detroit very quickly for those that did not come yesterday. Detroit's a very large city. Everything that's in blue is Detroit. Take Manhattan, San Francisco, and Boston and put it in the Detroit footprint, and you still have land left over. Those three cities have a combined population of 3.3 million people. Detroit's about 600,000. We've lost 1.3 million people since 1951. Uh, so we have a lot of land available. Detroit used to look like that. That's not a parking lot, those are houses. In 1951, when we were at our height of our population of 1.9 million people, 98.9% .9 of all the land in the city of Detroit had something on it. Our population growth spiked from 200,000 in 1900 to 1 1.9 million, and now it's decreasing. We're hovering somewhere around 600,000 right now. Um, I, like, unlike most of the leaders in the city, are not worried about population. I'm more worried about quality of life. If we have a good quality of life, uh, with cheap land and you know streamlined permitting. I mean, we have a lot of opportunities for us without good quality of life, uh, good tax policy, good community services. Nobody's going to want to come to Detroit. So just trying to attract people there because we have space doesn't make a lot of sense to me. This is a land density map. So the darker the color, the more vacant the land. Uh, my project, Recovery Park, is going in right here. Our downtown area is right here. The big farmer's market is right here. 97% um, of all the households in this neighborhood have been gone for over 30 years. The neighborhood that I'm building my project in, the height of its population at 84,000 residents. Today it's got under 4,000 residents. It had over 2,800 structures. Today it has about 22. So this map is basically a map of our project area. It's 105 acres. Everything that's in blue and green is land that we bought from the municipality. So Detroit's the largest municipal landowner of its own land in North America. Uh, the city owns about a third of all the 140 square miles that's in the city. About 68,000 of those are structures that need to come down, and we're on a pathway to try and take them down. So what do we do? We grow produce. We grow specialty produce. Uh, these are four examples of what we grow. Nasturtiums, the, we sell the flowers and the leaves. Striped carrots, different types of green mixes, breakfast radishes, and we sell to restaurants. Why food? Why growing? Uh, indoor growing, which is what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the technology. Uh, for indoor growing, and you only need to go to Leamington, Ontario to see it, we're at a minimum 5.2 jobs per acre. Those are year-round jobs. They're not seasonal because there's always something growing. There's always something that needs to be harvested. There's always something that needs to be distributed. Compared to, and when you tie in value-added production, so taking a lettuce and making a lettuce mix and then selling it and then the distribution, we have close to 18 jobs per acre. This is why what Lauren talked about food system development, developing an economy around food, you know, let's say a food desert, is important. The ability to attract 18 new people or 18 existing people to a new industry in your town, uh, it, I think is really, really exciting. So Recovery Park started as an incubator idea. I was doing C-suite volunteer stuff for an organization called ShareHouse, which is a substance abuse treatment program in the city. I won't go into a long history because of time constraints, but I am a recovering addict. I've been in recovery a long time. I'm also a returning citizen. I spent three and a half years in federal prison because of my addiction. Uh, so the population that we're working with are chronically unemployed people in the city. There's about 90,000 of them uh, that have real challenges around prisoner reentry, around substance abuse, literacy, chronic homelessness. I mean, people that are really struggling. Food is a great introductory to the, back into the job market. My tomatoes don't care if you can't read and write. They don't care if you're coming out of prison. They don't talk back to you. They have very basic needs. You know, plant me, feed me, harvest me, sell me, right? And to watch somebody come out of prison that's been down for 25 years and take personal ownership of their plants and sit there crying because somebody's actually paying them for their time and their services and somebody's buying the product is really an amazing transformation. So in 2016, we've had two successful pilot projects. We're launching our first three-acre permanent facility. 
uh, which will, in five years will be a 105-acre facility. Uh, we're in 20 restaurants. We're selling about 30 different products. Um, by 2021, our annual sales will be $29 million. The $29 million is being achieved because we have signed a regional uh, distribution agreement with a regional distributor that is currently selling to 440 restaurants. It has four major casinos and the Henry Ford Health System, which is one of our big health providers. They're all buying this type of produce. Delbane Produce, our distributors, flying it in from California, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Mexico. What an inefficient way to bring food to our tables. So, technology. We look at all sorts of technology. Uh, from how do you clear the land, how do you clean it up, how do you rebuild the infrastructure around water and sewers, why is that important? The neighborhood that we're in started building in 1870. The water mains are wood. Uh, we have a combined sewer system, which, uh, which uh, when you flush your toilet or it rains, it all goes into one pipe. When too much of that's happening, even with the decrease in population, we're dumping raw sewage in the river. That's not very environmentally friendly. All old cities in North America do the same thing. So the early technology that's happening right now in partnership with the U.S. Uh, EPA and the U.S. Geological Survey Team is we have a $1.4 million dollar water harvesting project where instead of separating the storm and sanitary sewers, we're re-diverting the storm water in a system of swales that are going to be connected to our greenhouses and our high tunnels. And we're going to harvest the water, we're working with a couple of filtration companies with cutting edge technology to figure out how we can clean up the water to the point where maybe we can't use it in our hydroponic or our watering of our product but we can certainly use it for vegetable washing, we can use it in our bathrooms, we can use it to water the grass, you know, the gardens, you know, for, for flowers and those sorts of things. Other technology solutions, so we've been looking at oxygenation of, uh, to be able to clean up product. Um, we've been working with Priva and a couple of other companies on uh, nanosensor technology. The nanosensor technology is basically a farmer can look at a plant to tell if it's growing healthy or if it's diseased. But a lot of times if the plant's disease, by the time the farmer catches it, they have to take extraordinary measures to stop the disease. Rural farmers generally just apply pesticides, right? We don't want to do that. We're natural growers. So nanosensor technology basically catalogs healthy plants into a database. And there's cameras around greenhouses that are always going and taking pictures so that the cameras are so sensitive that they can actually tell a farmer a week and a half to two weeks ahead of time that this plant's having problems, what the potential problems are, and so we can address the situation you know, easier. It's more like preventative medicine as opposed to catastrophic medicine uh, for, for plants. We're working with our local energy providers, so DTE Energy, DTE Gas. We're working on bringing in a combined power and heat unit, which is using natural gas to provide turbine power for energy generation and for heating and cooling of greenhouses. We're looking at, we're working with a company called Next Tech, which is a DC power grid company based out of one of our think tanks called Next Energy in, in Midtown Detroit. Uh, DC power grid uh, cuts our energy consumption by close to 80% in our greenhouses. We also have a lighting experiment going on, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, uh, on LED lighting technology. It's happening at our big ag school, Michigan State University. Uh, we're experimenting with growing under glass six of our products. We're looking at uh, product health and you know the availability of the product uh, and how fast it grows. So natural sunlight, natural sunlight, high pressure sodium, which is the state of the art in the industry right now. Uh, if you go to Leamington, they have lights on all the time. And then you know natural sunlight and LED, both above canopy and inner canopy, and we're kind of experimenting with them to see which is going to be the most successful. So this is the first farm that we built. Um, it's basically a high tunnel uh, or a hoop house. A more, high tunnel is a little more sophisticated. It's got the gable roofs. It's got ventilation on both ends. The sides roll up and down. It has an inflatable roof. It adds a little bit of insulation value, uh, both in the winter and the summer. Uh, it's soil-based. We planted this greenhouse in one of the environmentally unfriendly areas of the city that we could find. It's the former part of the auto industry. We own the building there that was donated to us. This building is completely surrounded by manufacturing and railroad tracks. We said, let's prove to the city that you can grow great produce here. Uh, the high tunnel is 30 feet wide by 144 feet long. We bolted it down to a piece of uh, concrete in the back. 
We brought in pea gravel for drainage. We put in 18 inches of growing medium that we got from a company called Dairy Dew uh, up in northern Michigan. And yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's <laughs> um, and we've grown some of the most outstanding vegetables that Detroit restaurants has ever seen in this high tunnel. We've got over 70 different varieties over a two and a half year time frame that have come out of it. The other type of technology that we're going to start building in the spring are greenhouses. So our greenhouses are very similar to what you have in Leamington, Ontario, if you've ever been there. The difference is that we're not building 50 and 100 acre greenhouse complexes growing one kind of tomato or one kind of pepper. We're building three acre glass greenhouses that are going to specialize in growing a minimum of three complementary vegetables in that greenhouse. Uh, because of the type of produce that we sell, but we're looking at all sorts of different types of technology. So the pink lighting strips are the LED lighting. Uh, in this case, this is just basic Philips uh, energy lighting strips. Ours are a little different. Uh, the, you have the sunshades, you have the fans, you have watering systems in here. They're all controlled by advanced technology ideas. They're all controlled by IT. They're all controlled by computers. We want to tie our nano sensor technology into these computers so literally people can walk into the greenhouse, print up a report on what the greenhouse has been doing the previous night so they can see where the challenges are. This is another example. These are actually high pressure sodium lights. Uh, you can see that the plants move on manual roller systems. So the roller systems allow you to move the plants back and forth the long way of the greenhouse. They also, so as the plants mature, you can move them toward the front end of the greenhouse, but then the different stages are growing, you can actually move them from greenhouse to greenhouse, so the walls separate the different climates. So the plants actually have one climate when they're germinating, they have a different climate when they're baby plants, they have a different climate when they're growing and the fruiting, they have a different climate when they're harvesting, and a different climate when you're taking them to dormancy. Uh, so this allows us to, to maintain that, that plant integrity. So our footprint today looks like this. It's pretty barren. Uh, the streets are, are there, uh, but uh, there's not a lot of other stuff going on there. Uh, the first thing that we're doing is we're putting in the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So this is the first technology that we're implementing, and it's a water harvesting project. So basically, we've cut the curbs so that the curbs slope down into the drains by the rocks, and the drains are even lower or higher, I'm sorry, so that the water's forced into the pile of rocks, uh, and that's a, basically a cistern. The water also has an opportunity to flow into swales here so that the swales can divert the water to the pile of rocks where the cistern is. Only in a 10-year rain event, which happens about once every 10 years in the city of Detroit, uh, the water level will get so high that the water will go into the storm sewer system. So it's really, really critical for us because the Detroit Water and Sewer Department just instituted a stormwater management fee in the city of Detroit to help pay for stormwater. Uh, it's $671 per acre of impervious surface per month. Okay, So this is going to mitigate 80% of my stormwater management fees, and it's being paid for by the US government. So I'm a happy camper. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start building our greenhouses. So you can see that the greenhouses actively tie into the green infrastructure system. These are not the actual greenhouses we're going to build. They're basically renderings to kind of show people what glass greenhouses look like coming into a neighborhood. Um, but the glass greenhouses themselves are going to have very advanced systems in them, from heating and cooling to lighting. Uh, you know, our incinerator where we burn all of our trash uh, is about five blocks away. Uh, one of the big byproducts of the incineration of trash is steam, because the steam turns the turbines that create the energy. So we're looking at can they bring a pipe for the excess steam, because it comes in at about 800 pounds per square inch into our footprint. And we're working with another company around technology to convert the steam uh, into heating and cooling for the greenhouses. So you can see another example of the technology of the greenhouses coming into the stormwater system. Another example, so housing on the left side, our project on the right side. Just another picture of the neighborhood. So in five years, if you come to the city of Detroit, you come to my neighborhood, you call me up and say, Gary, I'm here to see your project. What are you going to see? You're going to see this side of greenhouses, the big buildings, and high tunnels. So you'll see a minimum of 22 acres under glass and nine acres under high tunnel. 
Why the difference? So there's even technology at play there. Root-based vegetables do really well in soil. We want to make sure that we maintain the integrity of our great root-based vegetables by growing them in an environment that they love. Uh, there's some challenges with that because we're trying to figure out how to heat the soil so we don't have to heat the air in the, in the high tunnels as much, so we're looking at passive solar systems. Um, we're working with another a couple of companies on, on shielding. So Terry and I talked today about bubbles. I want to talk more about that. Um, you know, on the high-tech side, on the greenhouses, we're growing things that have high water content, things like lettuce and, and herbs, you know, and to make sure, but again, the same sorts of problems. So how do you keep the temperatures in the greenhouses at an appropriate level? I'm running out of time. I know. No, it's got oh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So on this side, we have a different type of greenhouse, and it's a different type of technology. It's called Cravo System. So Cravo Systems are basically retractable roof greenhouses. They're not as sophisticated as a Leamington greenhouse, but they're a little more sophisticated than a high tunnel. What the technology allows us to do is to grow fruit trees and raspberries and strawberries and blueberries in a controlled environment to protect it against early and late freeze-thaw cycles and also against avian pests. So imagine the type of weather that we're having now. We have the greenhouse open when it's 65 degrees. The minute we know the cold weather's coming, we can close the roof on the greenhouse. The other thing is when the fruit starts to get to the point where the birds are going to dive in and take it all, uh, which is not a bad thing for the birds, but it's a bad thing for a business that you're trying to make money on, uh, you can close the roofs of the greenhouses and the birds can't get out. They've been experimenting with it in northern Michigan where we grow 90% of the world's tart cherries. Uh, and what they found with the Cravo system is that they had an increase of 30% yield of the cherries because of the protection, and they, lo and they lost none of their product. So they had 100% of the product actually harvested from the trees based on, based on their predictions. So that's kind of my story. I mean, technology is really, really critical to our success. For us to invest $30 million in building out these facilities, uh, you know, and for us to be able to maintain the quality of our product uh, it's important that technology plays a role. The other reason that technology is important is, is one of the biggest contributors toward greenhouse success or non-success are energy costs and water costs. So our ability to control those costs is really, really critical. Uh, we, we employ something called intentional technology. So intentional technology means that just because it's created today and it's on a cell phone and you can dial it on an app, doesn't make it the best technology. If it's technology for growing that comes out of 1400s, and it works, we want to use it. Our goal is not to replace humans, okay? Humans need to be involved in food system development. We're a project to create jobs for people, not projects to create jobs for technology. So we want to make sure that we don't have the plant the seed, push the button, take the product out the back end. We want to demonstrate that people do need to be involved in growing and distributing and harvesting produce. Uh, the technology is just an enabler to help us do that. You know, um, it was very interesting to hear, you know, city leadership talk today about, you know, getting involved in, in food system development, and uh, I forgot your name, but, you know, the, the planning department being actively involved. It took the city of Detroit 20 years to get to the point where you're at today. Uh, so, so I really applaud the, the work that you're doing. So, thank you. My time is up. Yeah. <laughs>